you've probably seen and heard our featured speaker just a little bit on the news lately, like every 20 minutes or so. Anybody wax? Everybody's, you're good with the commercials, right? You could stand like another month of them, right? He's in the room, so you have to say that, of course. Um, but over the past several weeks, you've seen quite a bit of both of the candidates. But today, our guest is Paul Vallis. He's dedicated so much of his life to public service and has served as, listen to this, Executive Director of the Illinois Economic and Fiscal Commission, Revenue Director of the City of Chicago, Budget Director of the City of Chicago, CEO of Chicago Public Schools, and Superintendent of Schools in Philadelphia, New Orleans, and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Paul is the grandson of Greek immigrants. He grew up in the Roseland neighborhood. He and his wife, Sharon, joined us last time, but today his sister, Marianne, is with us, keeping it all in the family. So without further ado, I think you don't want to hear any more from me. Where is Mr. Vallis? What are you doing over there? Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Let me just also acknowledge uh, um, a couple of people uh, in the crowd who uh, um, ran uh, with me as we, there were, I think, nine of us running. And of course, Rod Sawyer, who I've known for years and has had such a distinguished career and it's royalty, political royalty. You know. Um, Where's, um, where's Dr. Green, Jamal Green, where is he? Uh, I also saw uh, Representative uh, Curtis Tarver here, who has been sending, when I've been most depressed, has sent me biblical verses. And I mean biblical verses that have been very therapeutic. Thank you so much, I've saved them all. I appreciate that, because he knows what we all put. Give him a round of applause, please. These are individuals who are extraordinarily connected to their community, and you know, um, being being around uh, um, you know, being around Rod and being around uh, uh, Jamal and, and being around um, Representative Tarver is, is like ha having your own personal TED talk, and it's really extraordinary because uh, I'm a wonk and I process everything. I always tell people before I make a speech, don't talk to me for an hour because anything you give me at the last minute, I'm going to just systematically process. Uh, I also want to recognize Gary Chico, uh, who, my longtime partner in Chicago at the Chicago Public Schools. And one more person, Gila Browner, who I've worked with in four different districts, including Philadelphia and, and New Orleans, and who I had the privilege of working with for Sally Yates in the Justice Department on an extraordinary project that unfortunately was dismantled when she left, but we're going to reestablish when I become mayor. Gilas, please stand up and take a bow. Uh, as a school superintendent, a longtime school superintendent, um, uh, I could not begin my comments without expressing uh, my condolences uh, to the families of the lost loved ones in, in the just tragic shooting in Nashville. Um, this is a superintendent's nightmare. And I have, um, there have been 230 school shootings in the last 10 years, and it's three times the number of the previous 10 years. And there are over 30 superintendents who at one time or another worked for me. Some claim that they worked for me, some claim that they didn't, some I claim, some I don't claim. <laughs> You know, including including one U.S. one U.S. Education Secretary, and two of those superintendents have had multiple shootings in their schools. So, um, and I remember when I was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, our neighboring school district, Sandy Hook, I happened during my watch, and and I actually had a teacher who had had a first grade child in that classroom. Um, I. There were 20 children killed. There were a number of adults killed, including the teacher in that classroom. And it's just the, more, the most horrendous, horrendous thing. And, you know, obviously, we've got to um, uh, tackle the issue of, of keeping our children safe through a multi-pronged approach. But, uh, but I will always be a strong advocate for having police officers outside schools 
uh, to deter active shooters because it's just a crisis and it's a recurring crisis and the number of shootings seems to be escalating. So I, I just wanted to extend um, my condolences because uh, as any superintendent or teacher, for that matter, any parent, when you send your kids to school, uh, you expect them to go to school and to be safe and, and to come home safely. And it's um, and, and there are so many challenges that we face. Um, well, first of all, good good afternoon. It's it's fitting that my last speech that I deliver in this hard fought campaign, and I think this is our 370th straight day of camp campaigning. Although I shouldn't complain because the people who are helping me on this campaign are actually working longer hours than me because when you put me to bed, they're still at work. In fact, uh, Brian Tom, my campaign manager, we've told our, uh, our spouses that after this campaign, we're gonna have to go to couples therapy. <laughs> but um, it's fitting that, that uh, I deliver this speech at uh, Margiano's uh, and, and the City Club where I have spoken many, many times before in so many different capacities. And I was here as city budget director. I was here as the public school CEO. I was here as candidate for governor. I was here when I was rebuilding the school system in New Orleans, in New Orleans have to get that right, in New Orleans uh, after, after Hurricane Katrina. But I've always been invited and I've always enjoyed my, my talk. Um, none of these titles, however, is as important to me as the title that preceded them all, and that's Chicago and through and through. As mentioned, I was born in Roseland on the south side where my immigrant grandparents settled neatly a century ago and pursued the American dream. There are six veterans in my family. There are four police officers, now three, because my, um, my oldest boy, who's a combat veteran, wanted to, take, wanted to get at least a couple days off, so he decided to become a firefighter. And of course, three teachers, and what would a Greek family be with at least one Greek restaurant? Ultimately, we had three. My dad decided that he wanted to spend more time with the family, so we opened the restaurant, so we worked seven days a week. <laughs> but as with many others with distinct histories, cultures, and struggles, um, they came to pursue a better life, a chance to raise a family, own a home, start a business, get a good education, and retire with dignity and security. For all the lofty talk about who we are and what we want and what we stand for, it really still comes down to the basic American promise of a job, of a home, of health care, of education, and of retirement. And to pursue them for ourselves and our children in safety and with freedom of personal choice and personal identity. Throughout all my years of public service, I've never lost sight of the fact that the people, no matter who they are or where they come from, just want a good life for them and their families. I do not believe Chicagoans are asking for government to solve all their problems or to assume all their responsibilities. I, I think people just want government to be a good partner, uh, a partner that will help them meet their basic needs and to help them fulfill the American promise. Today, unfortunately, that promise goes unfulfilled. Whether it's affordable housing, jobs, safety, a reliable transit system, quality schools, safe drinking water, or public safety, there's an unsettled feeling among the people of Chicago that government isn't holding up its end of the bargain. They are asking obvious questions. Why isn't the city that works working for everyone? And why is the city that works not working anymore? How come we can no longer count on the basics? A police officer on the corner who can respond to emergencies in minutes rather than hours, but a police officer who knows the community and a police officer who is known to the community. Parks that are clean and safe, drinking water that is free of lead and other contaminants. A local store where people can have quality food choices. A grocery store in every neighborhood. And they are also asking those questions with a new lens forged by 21st century values. Many, as I've mentioned, recognize that the city of, uh, that worked for them, and that may have worked for their parents, has never really worked for many other, in fact, too many other members of our community. That's always been my approach. Whether trying to improve schools, balance the city's budget, 
or working to help earthquake victims in Haiti, I have always relentlessly pursued a vision that is inclusive, equitable, and expansive in its objective to get the job done, a vision of government and a vision in government that works for everyone, for all the people, for all communities. They say every election is the most important election in our lifetime. And that's true in a sense because an election is about what we are going to do now and what we are going to do in the next four years. But some elections matter more than others. And it's no exaggeration that this may be the most important election in a while, if not in our lifetime. We're coming off one of the most disruptive events in our history. Our downtown is half vacant, a ghost town in the middle of a work week. Our schools have lost a year of learning or more. Test scores have plummeted. Every public agency is facing a major financial cliff in the coming years when the federal COVID money dries up. And crime is simply not under control. Chicago is failing in its basic promise to the people of Chicago, a promise of safe streets, quality schools, affordability, and equal opportunity. And for the coming election, you have been presented a choice of which two pathways the city will follow if it is to move forward. And these two pathways could never be more dissimilar. While we might agree, while both, both me and my opponent might agree, might agree on issues inherent to our democratic values, like a woman's right to choose. We disagree on critical issues that impact everyday Chicagoans in each of our communities. My opponent wants to defund the police and further jeopardize the safety of families across the city. While we both have plans to get at the underlying causes of crime, there is no substitute for effective and accountable policing in our city. We must realize, as Democrats, that public safety is a fundamental human right. And failing to fill police vacancies and defunding our police will make our city more dangerous. When it comes to public safety, however, we have to do more. We need to support the community network of violence prevention organizations to make them a permanent feature of our public safety strategy and landscape. They are doing heroic work all over the city, intervening in disputes, anticipating retaliation to, uh, shootings, reactions, negotiating peace agreements among warring street factions. They're occupying hotspots across the city during the evenings and on the weekends. And the best ones are doing it in a quiet and coordinated way with the local police districts. And where we have failed to steer a young person to a productive path, either through failing schools or through our failure to introduce them to the work world, where we have failed to do that at the front end, we have to be there for them on the back end. That means reentry programs for returning citizens that support them with housing and treatment and education, job and life skill training, treatment for trauma were needed and an entry opportunity back into the economy. That means removing the obstacles for them to become employed. The next mayor needs to smooth out the pathway by working with the business community to help create these economic opportunities, but by also constructing budgets that are truly investment vehicles and create the type of conditions, the type of conditions that can overcome the historic disinvestments that have created so many of the conditions that lead to our promises today. My opponent believes that we need more money from taxpayers as he's unrolled an $800 million tax plan, a tax plan that is not a tax to rich plan, a tax plan that would pummel working families and small businesses. I don't. The mayor indirectly controls $28 billion in spending, and that doesn't even count the $1.1 billion in property taxes that are diverted to the, prop, to the tax increment financing districts. And those are monies from the city, controlling the money from the schools, the CTA, the CHA, the water department, the sewer department, the airports, the park district, uh, the city colleges, 
an enormous, an enormous amount of resources available. I'm not going to ask the people of this city for another penny until I've scoured every one of those budgets to make sure that the money is being spent thoughtfully, intentionally, and equitably in ways that prioritize what Chicago's need, but also in ways that invest in those communities that have long been underinvested in. We demonstrated our capacity to do that in the Chicago, Chicago Public Schools, Gary Chico and I, when we not only balanced budgets and increased teacher salaries, but when we built 78 schools, the overwhelming vast majority serving poor black and Latino children, the majority of those schools on the south and west side. And when we opened the campuses through the dinner hour on weekends and over the holidays, when we created work study opportunities for the children, so we have done it before, and we did it in a way that held the line on taxes. I will tell you this. Not only will I restore the schools to a community-based school model that has the schools working for the community, that has the immense resources that are allocated to the schools finding their way to provide the support services that are needed uh, so that schools can provide a comprehensive array of supports for children, and schools can create and, and uh, opportunities for work study. Of the 26 unions that have endorsed me, I have asked them all to make commitments to creating work study opportunities for our young people, work study opportunities that will be supported by the schools, work study opportunities that would introduce them and connect them to the trades, uh, to the plumbers, uh, to the building engineers, to every single, to uh, police, fire, to the first responders, introduce them, expose them to a work world where they're surrounded by the best and most important work role models in the community, and that's working men and women. But if we will use the schools as a vehicle to transform communities, we will also do what has not been done before. Do what the mayor, I believe, is attempting to do with her Southwest Initiative. It's, it's not only about maintaining the commitments and honoring the commitments that she's made, but also building upon those commitments. Because let's face it, she definitely put her money where her mouth was on this initiative. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand upon that initiative. As mayor, as mayor, I will institute my Burnham 2.0 plan. And let me point out that I articulated a similar plan f four years ago, but I called it the Marshall Plan for Chicago. And I knew that I had lost a little momentum there when I had to explain in radio interviews who, uh, dr who Marshall was. <laughs> All right, so, so new title, similar expanded plan. But this Burnham 2.0 plan, I actually unveil, unveiled here at the City Club a number of months ago. I don't even remember how many because I'm losing track of time. But that plan is designed to activate and reactivate wealth that exists in that very community to the benefits of people within the community. And I've articulated at length what that can be but the center and how that can be done. But the focus of that plan should be the approach that basically says development should be done with specific community-based outcomes in mind, leaving not just buildings, but permanent local jobs, affordable housing, social services, the keystones of sustaining, of self-sustaining and self-owned neighborhood economy, because that's how you empower the community by creating local ownership and by creating local wealth accumulation because ownership in wealth can be transferred from generation to generation. <laughs> and we have to stop declaring victory when we put the first shovel in the ground. And we have to continue digging after the cameras have gone until we have a self-sustaining community economy in place. So yes, my opponent 
and I have some real differences on how to get things done. Very serious things that will impact the trajectory of our city in its future. These issues require a leader with real financial and leadership experience. Experience that my opponent simply does not have. At this critical time, we cannot afford anyone who lacks the experience, nor can we afford another four years of divisive and combative leadership. Now, you all know that I like to talk about policy, about ideas, and that I get really excited about them, and I can't stop talking about them, even when I should. But let me be clear about one thing. My record of public service is not based on wonky wizardry. It is based on bringing people together with talent, passion, and perspectives to work collaboratively to transform ideas and policy into programs of action, programs of action that deliver. <laughs> Not me, but us. Together, I, by drawing from the community and communities that I've served, have balanced budgets and managed numerous multi-billion dollar budgets in multiple cities. Together, me and people that I've drawn from the community have built hundreds of thriving community schools. And that includes rebuilding an entire school system from scratch, a system that had 110 of its 120 schools either destroyed or rendered uninhabitable by Katrina, and building a system that for seven consecutive years led to state and academic improvement. There is no child in New Orleans who is not in either a new school or a completely renovated school. That is real success. That is real leadership. But it's not a solo act. It's the type of collective leadership that every executive needs to tap into if that execu executive is going to be successful. So to, so to my opponent, I say, show me a public rescue project with no critics and I'll show you an omelet that was made without breaking a single egg. <laughs> Public administration, like life, is messy, but, it, but the outcome in lives saved and futures built is, like life, very beautiful. So why this journey? Why this latest call to duty? Paul Vallis, the wonk, is a public administrative version of a first responder. And right now, our house is on fire, and its occupants are in danger, both figuratively and literally. So at one level, I can't help it. It's what I do. It's what I've always done. I am optimistic that, the many, that many of the issues that we face are solvable, but they will require a leader with the experience and the track record of accountability to get the job done for all of Chicagoans, to help those like my immigrant grandparents achieve the American dream, not only for themselves, but for their children and grandchildren. I started this speech by talking about the American promise, the basics that people of what people want and need in their lives, a promise that has long been denied in this city for those who need it the most. On day one, I will strive tirelessly to make sure that everyone who lives and works here, raises a family here, and grows old here feels safe, secure, and free. I will make sure they have a quality of life, ensuring that they have safe neighborhoods, affordable taxes, decent schools, and good jobs. Above all, I want to make sure that the city of Chicago, that was set up to serve them and to solve their problems, is actually doing its job. My name is Paul Vallis, Chicagoan, public servant, problem solver, who loves his city and sees its best days ahead, who knows how government works and how to make it work for everyone. And I want to be your mayor, so let's do it. The real Chicagoans do it. Sleeves rolled up together. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank now you. I, now Thank I you, get, Paul. Now I get to be wonky. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I'm going to challenge you. <laughs> Thank you. We'll let you get, catch a drink of water. And, okay. You've been doing this quite a we bit. We have. Lately. We have 14 events yesterday and 18 the day before. And, and uh, of course, we have a public debate tonight. So our You're last at City Club debate. now, your favorite. But we're right? at City Club. This is my safe space. <laughs> Well, I won't go too. I, I won't only steal that because I'm going to need it. But I won't. Okay. Uh, I won't go too hard on you. Um, but know that we ask all the right questions, right? We've got plenty of them. Uh, and if you do have questions, I'm basically telling you it's too late. We've got about 30 of them. So <laughs> if you have a really, really good question, send it up, and we'll see if we can fit it in. But so many of them here, uh, and I'm going to try to ask a few that maybe you haven't. You know, you've been on the circuit, right? But we'll try to, to ask a couple different ones here and see if. Uh, not stump you, but but hear what what's behind everything that you're planning to do here. Um, so you you were just ending a bit with your your experience, undoubtedly very deep, substantial experience over so many years. And to, to people who would say we were better off back then than we are now, that's kind of music to their ears, right? Um, yet to so many others, you know, they, they would counter that by saying things have changed. There's new technology. There are new systems. There's new leadership. Right. And laws. You know. How would you bridge that that old way that has proven right with some of these new talent, you know, the new generations, new talent, and, and new ideas, and keep an open mind to all of that? Well, I think most of the things that I'm talking about are new ideas. Burnham 2.0 is not a return to the past. There's never been a real sustained approach at Southwest Development. I think the mayor has made an effort. Uh, where other mayors did more talking, I, I think. Uh, she has attempted to put real, real resources behind it. But all the things that I've articulated are really uh, initiatives that are built on experience, the experience that you learn over time about what works and what doesn't work. But what has always guided my approach to public service has always been drawing from the community the type of diverse, talented leadership teams that have allowed me to be successful. And look, I mean, in campaigns, people are always going to put out misinformation. But how many times have I come before the city club to talk about our triumphs, our success in the Chicago public schools, our transformation of Philadelphia when I think U.S. World News Report selected me as one of 20 of America's best leaders, or for that matter, the transformation of New Orleans that drew praise from three presidents. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, I learn from experience and I process things, but my approach has always been driven towards looking at budgets as investment vehicles, as vehicles that are designed to create the uh, type of economic synergies uh, that can, in effect, grow communities. And we are not going to transform. Uh, I mean, we're not going to grow the city of Chicago uh, unless we invest in those communities that have been long neglected. So, you know, my opponent would like to say that we're returning to the old days. Incidentally, when we had structurally balanced budgets and we had a murder rate that's about half it is now, or we had schools when it had 125,000 more students than we have now. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, clearly we did some things right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think as a public policy person, my ability to evolve and my ability to basically bring my approach, my equity approach to, to multiple cities with great success is a, uh, is a product of my ability to draw people from within the community and, and also my ability to ad adapt and to adapt to changing conditions. Great. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned misinformation in campaigns. Campaigns are very interesting things, right? We've seen a lot. Uh, and I think just yesterday, um, there have been some, some recent allegations that your values and maybe your yard signs aligned with MAGA. Do you want to talk about that yeah, for a second? Look, maybe, clearly, maybe clearly, if it's not, clear it up. Clearly, my opponent is putting out yard signs on the south and west side with ballast for MAGA. And, of course, people are taking them down. So, clearly, that's that's being done. In fact, today, uh, um, my opponent, uh, or I should say the Chicago Teachers Union, because I'm really running against the Chicago Teachers Union leadership. Look, I'm running against uh, someone who is still an employee for the Chicago Teachers Union who actually get a teacher's contract or a pension despite having only worked as a teacher for four years in a school that I built in Cabrini Green when Cabrini Green was still there, the Jenner School. And 80% of its funding actually comes from the Chicago Teachers Union and affiliates. So at the end of the day, there's been a lot of things. You know, they put out something today 
uh, under the logo of, uh, of uh, one of the legendary community newspapers. Uh, and, uh, and I got a call from the editor today basically telling me that she's going to put on an editorial basically condemning them for what they did. So I think they, uh, they want the, this to be a, a, about something other than resume. They, they, they don't want to talk about the issues. They would rather divert people's attention. And, you know, planting these maggot signs on the southwest side or putting the stickers is clearly just another attempt to, to uh, basically, uh, you know, try to run against someone who is actually not running. And so, you know, we're going to expect more of this in probably the final days, but we're plowing away. We're getting our message out. I'm going to continue to try to focus on the issues as I have. And, uh, but, you know, hopefully, you know, it's, it's extraordinarily insulting when you think you can do these type of things and the community is actually going to take the bait. I just said, you know, my approach to the community has always been to go out and talk to the community. We've had what? 32 community forums, aldermanic rallies, uh, aldermanic rallies, um, uh, aldermanic district rallies in, in all of the cities where I, I've not only stayed to shake every hand, but I've stayed to answer every question. So hopefully people will see through this nonsense and really focus on someone who has a track record of supporting the community and will be there on election day. Great. Uh, and, and given all that negativity, it's also interesting to see some so much positivity when you, nine candidates all kind of going at each other, each with their own ideas. It was really nice to, to have you acknowledge some that, that ran here today. But I also really noticed you and, and, and Brandon, uh, Commissioner Johnson, couldn't be on two different sides of the spectrum, right? Yet you seem to have a nice relationship and, and, and are at least cordial. He's got ideas. You've got ideas. If you were to win, would you, would you include some of those? Would you, was there any, um, is there any, any place for Commissioner Johnson or look, his ideas? Look, he's going to be one of the executives in the Chicago Teachers Union. And let me point out that uh, um, when I uh, and Gary Chico and I took responsibility for Chicago Public Schools, there had been eight strikes in 15 years. And that was the union of Jackie Vaughn. Remember how active she was. You remember the, the longest teacher strike was during the Harold Washington years. Uh, so at the end of the day, um, yeah, we were able to negotiate uh, two, con two four-year con contracts that raised teacher salaries 27%. And we had Union Peace. And in Philadelphia, I had similar success. In, in New Orleans, um, I actually... Uh, had to recruit 700 teachers in 90 days because the entire, uh, all the teachers, the, the city had been pretty much evacuated and every teacher that returned uh, was hired and placed in a school. And of course, even in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I had a more tense relationship with the teachers union president, um, we still uh, had labor peace and raised teacher salaries. So I believe that I've demonstrated the capacity to negotiate with just about anyone. But I'll tell you how you do that. You do it, first of all, by negotiating directly. Uh, Jim Francis, like, where's Jim? Where's Jim here? Uh, there's Jim. Jim's looking I was for just going to mention Jim's Jim, name. Jim is looking for a job now. So, you know what I mean? We're going to have a tag sale day because Jim had the audacity of discussing how I was able to basically help the city conclude a collective bargaining agreement uh, with the uh, uh, with the police that included all the accountability provisions that were being demanded, and the police passed that contract with almost eighty percent. But also a contract that that I did not take pay for, which of course irritated my wife to no end. Even though uh, they did put that pay, they uh, gave it to a children's charity. But the bottom line is, I think we've dem our my approach uh, from. The first time I began to negotiate contracts in the 1990s as city budget director was really to be involved personally and not negotiate through anyone or communicate to the union leadership through surrogates. So whether they like you or don't like you, it's that human contact that's important. It's their ability to call you and for you to respond. And then to continue to com com converse with them, even in between uh, in between like contract negotiating years. So we would meet with the, with the unions, all the unions, whether it was the, the FOP of the Nolan years back in the nineties or whether it was with Danny Fabriz, uh, uh, um, Fabrizio, uh, or for that matter, whether it was uh, the gr late great uh, Tom Reese, we would meet monthly. We would meet monthly so we could resolve things. And the second thing, and my approach has always been to directly communicate with the rank and file and not have 
the union president speak for me. I think that's why I have such broad support among not only rank and file police officers, but rank and file firefighters. So I think initially the leadership was a little reluctant to support me, but the rank and file gave them no choice. So my approach, and remember, I'm endorsed by, I think, 26 labor unions. So clearly my ability to communicate and meet with them uh, individually and their members individually, I think that are the key to effective labor relations. You can't let anybody communicate for you with their rank and file members, and you've got to establish a personal relationship with the, I, I, I'm talking about from a negotiating standpoint, you've got to negotiate face to face and not through surrogates. See a lot of nods from Jim Francic back there. Yes. I, I'd like to uh, propose maybe or plant the seed that uh, <laughs> you've got a few stories from a few years of your experience. Maybe we could do a city club master class on negotiating. And we'll talk, Jim. Um, reproductive justice. This is this was a, a question that came yesterday, uh, and and we actually didn't get to ask it. I, I wanted to ask it uh, of both candidates. Um, again, there's so many. But Megan Murphy from Personal Pack asked a great question yesterday we, we, we didn't get to. What do you see as the role of the city of Chicago and its mayor in the fight for reproductive justice? Yeah. Look, you know, my opponent clearly has attempted to tarnish my reputation based on a conversation I had about Greek orthodoxy and religious beliefs. My position is the same as Biden's and Joe and, and um, Nancy Pelosi. I, I have always been uh, uh, a, a un, uncompromising supporter of women's reproductive rights and providing women uh, with access uh, to uh, the public health services that they need so that those rights uh, and other healthcare needs can be, uh, you know, can be addressed and can be supported. Just not for Chicagoans, but anyone who wants to come to this city uh, should be guaranteed. So that's just a fact. I, it's just a, remember, I, you know, and every single time I ran, uh, uh, including um, when I ran with Pat Quinn, I always got like a hundred percent approval rating from, uh, you know, from uh, from the various groups. So I, I've always been uh, strongly supported. You also have to remember who I first went to work for, and I ended up having a twenty-year relationship with, and that was Don Clark Netch. So just not on the issue of women's reproductive rights, but on the issue, but on the issue of LGBT. Uh, the bottom, I put right, Jim. We put. Uh, uh, domestic partners in the city contracts in the 90s before was extremely, extremely, uh, and before uh, when it was not the most popular thing. And Tom Reese asked me to do that, but he wanted me to take the heat for it because then there was heat from even among the members. And of course, when I ran against Rob Blagojevich, uh, I supported marriage equality when it was called gay marriage 12 years before Biden and and President Obama uh, um, crossed the Rubicon on that issue. So I've always been way ahead on these issues. I think they wanted to run against, uh, you know, um, a right-wing conservative. And when they found that they were running against a, you know, an extremely competent, accomplished uh, uh, progressive, because if you're talking about MBWB, if you're talking about support for women's reproductive rights, if you're talking about uh, transforming schools into community schools that can serve the community. If you're talking about if you're talking about record hiring of minorities, if you talk about allocating budgets in ways that supported even the mayor's opponents in a period of time when you had the Harold Washington block and they would routinely vote against the mayor's budgets. Of course, my budgets were supported unanimously. Rod can tell you that. I mean, that's the type of progressive that actually produces results. But that's not their narrative. See, so. If there's, you know, if the record, if the body of work does not fit their narrative, then they have to invent a narrative. And that's what they've done. And it's just the nature, unfortunately, of politics. And you, you have to hope that people see through that. But let me just make one comment, because we're ignoring also a number of other issues. I mean, there is a crisis in domestic violence in this city. 66,000 outstanding warrants, many of them... Uh, uh, um, uh, warrants against individuals who have repeatedly engaged in domestic violence is only 150 beds available for uh, women and children who are the victims of domestic violence. They get 200 uh, beds. Uh, uh, they get 200 calls a day. 
you know, I think the police are, are, are effectively responding to only a fraction of the cases. So, and I saw a statistic that said that domestic violence shootings, uh, related shootings have skyrocketed this year. So, uh, you know, I mean, where's the, they need a comprehensive strategy. And I've talked about not only uh, um, creating a mayoral commission that can focus uh, on, on, on women's issues, particularly health, women's health and safety issues. But I've talked, I've also talked about, uh, uh, and, and obviously no greater issue than protecting a, a woman's reproductive rights. But I've also talked about um, uh, creating a deputy police superintendent's uh, uh, position within the police department. So uh, who can focus on domestic violent crimes and, and, and hate crimes. So at the end of the day, these things need to be prioritized and I will create the infrastructure to ensure that these things are prioritized. I really enjoyed hearing that because you just knocked off four questions off of my list. I don't know if you're looking at them. I didn't share them earlier. We did, we had a couple of questions about LGBTQ+. We had um, um, Shara Revet from CCAC had asked about um, gender-based violence. So thank you for hitting on a lot of that. All, every one of these is I just, questions for every one of those are so such important issues that, that you clearly have, um, you know, in your mind regardless. Um, I'm gonna switch it up to the arts a little bit. We have two or three different questions. Um, and, and one of them is a little more particular than the others, but. Uh, Nicole Upton, uh, by the way, not a member. We're going to work on that. Ingenuity, <laughs> Ingenuity Inc. Oh, they're both from Ingenuity. Okay, Ingenuity is going to be on our list for future members. Um, what will you do to ensure all students in CPS have access to in-school arts education? And, and this is kind of similar. Let me just mention it. And you can, um, black students attending charter schools, so charter schools are less likely than other demographics have access to arts education. So how do you tend to fix this? So schools overall, but 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 maybe also focus a little bit on, on charter schools, if you could. Yeah, you know, let me give you um, my philosophy when it comes to schools. And, and it's a, and again, if it's an old philosophy and somehow that's a return to the, the bad old days when we actually sent the money to the local schools and we didn't have the central office intercept 40% of it, we're spending $30,000 a child in the Chicago public schools and only 60% finds its way into the classrooms. So I believe in community schools, money, the bulk of the money needs to flow to the local schools where the principals and their locally elected school councils. And God knows we battled with the local school council. There's Carlos Escortia who ran the Office of School Reform. I remember him. he was, when I came in, uh, the mayor actually wanted me to shake up the place. So I actually, I actually got rid of Carlos and then realized that I made a grave mistake. And 30 days later, I hired him back and gave more responsibilities. He, the Spry School, the original community school concept. So, you know, if you push the money down to the local schools and you give them the community the ability to keep those schools open after hours through the dinner hour or the summer or over the holidays and you bring community-based programs, including community-based arts programs, because, you know, there are so many groups out there. There are so many artisans out there that we can bring in and we can actually contract out. I mean, the, in New Orleans, uh, I mean, there was an abundance of, of art. I, obviously, obviously, the musical arts, and we were able to partner and we were able to put all these artists and musicians to work working in the schools. So push the money down to the local schools, give the local schools the autonomy to use that additional money to determine uh, what additional things their schools need, whether it's the arts, whether they want a more Afrocentric curriculum, wh whether they want to support an international baccalaureate program, and then really open the schools up to community-based organizations, just not only art organizations, but look, I mean, you have community-based early childhood providers that are actually being squeezed out because, you know, the school district wants all the early childhood providers to be school providers and the Chicago Teachers Union wants all the early childhood provider uh, 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 teachers to be CTU members. And you, you have all these community groups, particularly on the South and West Side, who have great expertise in this area. And they would love to be able to use the schools, access to schools, access to school facilities. I mean, probably 80% of the schools actually have space. And some of the schools have a lot of space. So partnering with the community, whether it's to, to invite the arts community in to get contracts to provide, uh, you know, to, you know, pr to provide their services, or inviting the community-based early childhood providers that dominate the landscape on the south and west sides 
Um, those are things that are inviting faith-based organizations to come in to do crisis intervention and mentoring, et cetera, or having the unions, uh, as well as city agencies and city departments create paid work-study internship opportunities for high school th kids. These are things that we have actually done before. Maybe some of the things we haven't scaled to the degree that I would like to scale, but these are things that can transform our schools. Thank, uh, thanks again. You hit another one. Check that off from Lane Alexander was asking about um, about cultural affairs and special events. So I think uh, in, in the interest of moving right along, but another quick arts question. This is easy. You mentioned you like movies. What's your favorite? What, what's not your favorite? What, what's the, the most recent favorite movie that you've seen? Anything good during the campaign? That came from Robert Foley. Well, you know, I have seen so many movies. There are not many movies left that I haven't seen. And I'm really feeling depressed because I've watched the movie every night. In fact, when I went to Haiti, I would have to load movies into my iPad because, you know, there was like one channel and it was always soccer. Or, or the uh, debates, the uh, in the uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, parliamentary debates that they they had or discussions, of course, which was usually in either French or Creole, so I didn't understand. <laughs> so, so at the end of the day, I would so I've seen every movie. So I, I watch movies again and again. And it's almost like transcendental meditation. Yeah, I remember when my mother went through her transcendental meditation, and she's thriving and dynamic and brilliant at ninety four. She would never tell me what her TM word was. For the life of me, she wouldn't tell me what her TM word was. So, so I will watch a movie like your Transcendental Meditation word. So um, a movie that I watch again and again is a wonderful movie uh, that Robert, Roger Ebert wrote one of his most emotional reviews about uh, when, he, when it was close to the end of his life. It was extraordinary. And it's called... Uh, uh, it's called The Upside of Anger, and it's a great movie with a spectacular ending. It's a great, if you watch that movie, read his interview. I mean, read his review. It, it gave me goosebumps. It's an extraordinary interview because uh, he was such a great writer. And then, of course, there's a movie that my brother likes, having grown up in the restaurant business, called Dinner Rush. And, uh, and if you see that movie, it's, that's an extraordinary movie, too. So those two movies are that and... And some of the early Guy Ritchie movies are movies that I have a tendency to watch again and again. And, and anything with Denzel Washington in it, because I had an opportunity to meet him and I had an opportunity to uh, meet Spike Lee when he came down to do a documentary uh, on New Orleans. And I remember he actually interviewed me, but part of my interview got bumped when Brad Pitt came to town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was there, <laughs> and, you know, I was in that interview, but I think my 30 minutes ended up being 10 minutes and Brad got to 20 minutes and I guess that's it. He's got priorities. <laughs> but the bottom line is I really had an opportunity to really interact with him and, 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 and talk movies. So those movies, particularly Black Klansman is what, and Inside Man are two of my favorites. All right. Some good insight there. The uh, movies aside, we understand that that's obviously a uh, therapy. A, a, a therapy for you. But but in 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 all honesty, we've been tackling mental health, especially here at City Club, over the last year or so, and and it's an issue that we we don't like that we have to deal with. But it's great to have it at the forefront. And um, we had uh, Dr. Murthy here, the Surgeon General in the U.S., talking about teens and. And, and we've had some follow-up since. So I've been weaving a question in with various leaders, whether it's in front of audiences or just in person, as we talk about this more, how how do you handle, and, and I don't mean, how, what are your policies on mental health? But you've, you're, you're traveling the city, you're meeting thousands and thousands of people, people that, that um, may not agree with you, uh, time that you don't have, sleep that you probably don't have, uh, and, and mental health is pretty difficult. How are you handling your own? I, obviously a little bit of movies, but no, I'd like to hear if there's, if you have any, any, any ideas or things that, that you may share with other leaders as you handle these really difficult issues and have to go to sleep at night. Uh, you know, the way I do it, clearly watching the movie is, is therapeutic uh, to me. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, um, you know, I have just like, I really feel that I have a, a body of work, uh, and, and I've, I've, you know, given so much thought to so many issues. Um, you know, just not obviously public safety, which is the overwhelming issue. But you know, I've posted 
on environmental issues. I posted my strategy on how to end the food deserts. I spent a lot of time, God, doing op-ed after op-ed about letting the drinking water saying, for heaven's sakes, just get water filtration systems into these homes now. I mean, even if they did the lead pipe replacements at an accelerated pace, uh, you're still, kids are still getting poisoned. The, the research is now overwhelming that there's a direct relationship between lead contamination at a young age and violent crime. I mean, it's just, the, the link is just, it's, it's you know, it, it's absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, indisputable. I just get the filtration system. So, you know, so, you know, I have confidence that I have the command of the issue. So what I've really done in this campaign is allowed myself to be managed. They schedule the events. I go to them. Uh, and um, and I try to avoid the social media stuff. I try to avoid the criticism that's thrown my way. I'm the type of person where if I put something out and somebody and 800 people respond and two people criticize me, I'll spend two days uh, responding to the criticism or just dwelling on the criticism. So I've tried to stay disciplined by kind of controlling my environment. And that doesn't mean I'm not interacting with people. I'm interacting with people all the time. But I've tried to minimize the distraction, particularly the personal attacks, you know, particularly somebody, I mean, who, who not only did the things that Gary Chico and I and, and Claire Moniana and, and the late Gene Saffold and Norm Bobbins and that we did and Ava Lavelle did at the Chicago Public Schools, but going to Haiti at the invitation of the, the Landrew family and then going to Haiti not one time, but, but 40 times, you know. My son died of long-term, uh, the impact of long-term drug, drug addictions, but he was clean when he was Haiti, when he was in Haiti. He was clean when he was working in Sean Penn's camp in Delma 32. I was finance chair of Sean's organization, and we took care of 50,000 displacations for five years. So when people throw out or try to play or try to make a, a personal tax uh, and simply ignore or misrepresent my body of work, it, that does offend me, but what I've attempted to do is to ignore it and to focus on the prize. I let my brother get upset, <laughs> you know, or poor Brian, who's going to need more therapeutic help than me, basically respond and get angry. Uh, 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 but, uh, but I'm comforted by the fact that, uh, you know, I got really emotional. I got really, really emotional when, uh, uh, when um, Bobby Rush endorsed me. Because I grew up during that period in which we were being hit by so many things. The Vietnam War and the specter that within three years we could be drafted. The 68 convention, the riots. I was at Curtis, a freshman academy in Fanger, that uh, uh, when Dr. King was was assassinated and, and later Kennedy was assassinated and all those things coming to bear at once. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, when Fred Hampton was killed and I remember Bobby Rush. So I got to know Bobby over the years. So when he came out and so strong, so, so strongly endorsed me, it was kind of an emotional moment for me because it was like a vindication moment. You know, because it was, because not that it wasn't expected, but it was a vindication. Because those were my formative years. That got me thinking as a longtime stutter and stammer, I, I began to observe things. You know, sometimes they say when you have certain senses that you struggle with, the other senses become more, more, more acute. And so I began to listen and to observe. When you're nonverbal, you do more listening. Now I'm, you can't shut me up. My mom says, my mom says that. I can attest to that. My mom says that you have so many words. My, my mother likes to say, God bless her. She says, you know, you have so many words in your life and your problem is you spent so many years nonverbal. Now you're making up for all those lost words. So I'm just making up. But the point is things like that are the long, my long relationship with you, with Emil Jones, uh, in the um, in the state senate, and his long support for me, uh, Jesse White, who I've known for forty years. I mean, those were I know those were important. Final spin, their final no, spin. Please. Those were important. Those were the you know those were vindicating moments for me because those are individuals I had known over decades, and the degree to which they helped me or don't help me uh, was 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 um, was less important 
to the fact that they enthusiastically supported me. So that gave me a sense of professional and personal satisfaction. Sorry. Don't, don't be sorry. I, again, Paul, I think you were reading some of my notes because what I asked Mecca to do was to give me a signal where I could then ask you to close out without facts or figures and find out what's inside there that really makes yeah. you want to run for mayor. And you, yeah. and you kind of did that. So yeah. I think it's a, a great way to finish up here, unless there's anything else you want to, no, you want to finish. We've got say, one week to go here. Yeah, you know, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I, I've, always thri I've always been thrilled at the opportunity to come back here time and time again. I remember one time, it was so funny, I just had these visual moments. And uh, I came here, I came here, um, I think I I think I was in Philadelphia at the time, and of course, I got invited to the City Club. And there was this long, big poster of Rob Gorovich. And, you know, I was always bald. And of course, you know, obviously Rod had that great head of hair. He still has a great head of hair. So I remember when they were taking pictures, I positioned myself. So I, I, I stood in front of Rod, but I had Rod's hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I remember they took pictures of that, you know what I mean? And I didn't say it. I didn't do it to be disrespectful by any stretch of the imagination. I just felt it was just an ideal moment because I kept on looking at the sign and I just fit perfectly. I just absolutely fit perfectly. <laughs> so anyway, I've only had the fondest memories uh, for coming here and I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, this is a critically important election. You know where I stand in the issues. Uh, I always tell people, look, if you're going to vote against me uh, because you don't agree with me on the issues, that's great. But try to understand my body of work and my commitment to the, not only the city, but the people in need. And at the end of the day, you know, I, you know, my record is out there for those who will take the time to look at it and to examine it. Because, you know, people can always distort. And as we see time and again, uh, just outright lie. Uh, but that should not be the politics that leads to a successful campaign. It's got to be driven by people who have real solutions and have made a real commitment to the community. So thank you very much. God bless all of you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul Vallis. Please enjoy. We've got dessert and uh, the bar is open out in the back. We look forward to many more discussions to come. City Club is adjourned. Thank you, Mecca.